Good evening and uh, thank you very much, Mint, for calling me over to share a few thoughts that I have regarding the path to Vikasit Bharat. I think we have spoken about why Vikasit Bharat, the Honorable Prime Minister himself, has, uh, while laying it out during one of his uh, Red Fort addresses, has said as to why it is important that India doesn't miss the bus yet again. And therefore, do everything that it takes to make sure that our younger generation, the youth who are revving to contribute to building this country, will have the benefit of living in an India which is much better than of course, what it is today, but meets all the requirements and aspirations of the current generation which has seen the world. But yet, home is where the heart is, and that's why India itself will have to match up, if not better, the best in the world. So, Vikasit Bharat's underlying principle or necessity to have a goal of that sort is so obvious and all of us can appreciate it. But are we in a position to reach that, even with the given time of 25 years in between? And if it is possible to reach, what are those milestones which on the way we will have to attain as we keep going towards that goal? The few things that we'll have to appreciate is since after 2014, you have seen relentless effort to remove those, if I may use the word, stains on India's economy, stains on India's political economy, and stains on what is perceived about India globally and within India. So it is the removal of the stains that actually has taken all the effort of a majority mandated government got, which got elected and the perseverance and the hard work of the Prime Minister and the entire government and the experience of a 10-year-long Chief Minister who understood governance and was ready to be open-minded about scaling things up so that we can make up through the use of technology what we missed out in decades. So you saw so many things happening in so many different fronts, but eventually, if you have to give a larger canvas to it, it was a canvas, as I said, where perception about India had to change, the ways we did business had to change, ways in which government interfered in common man's life had to be changed, and that is why you heard the Prime Minister very often saying, um, I'm searching for my words in Hindi, but Sarkar ka prabhav zada bhi hona nahi chahiye, abhav bhi nahi hona chahiye. So you need the government where it is required, but the government has to be somewhere at the background and not be overpowering the citizen's everyday life. So that required effort. If you would think that that is a, say, a straightforward thing, stay back, it doesn't happen that way because well-entrenched systems required uh, pulling up and also taking a step backward where government's intervention in our lives was not required. So very clear strategic interventions were made in the governance systems so that uh, ease of doing business was one of the nice expressions used. But the idea was that reforms at the center will have to also be reforms in the state level. And now come the third term, it will be carried to the third layer of panchayat and urban local bodies. So if the first five years went in making sure that the stains are removed and better governance was brought in, using transparency, uh, uh, obtaining transparency using technology, and making sure that the technology given identity for citizens is used for avoiding pilferage, 
you really bettered the system, toned up the system, and since you toned up the system, you had a system which could answer backward and forward so that you were able to trace every penny which is being spent. And very quickly, if I have to give you an example, by using direct benefit transfer, today I can confidently tell you, Government of India has saved something like 3 lakh crores from, from pilferages. If money had to go, it should go to the right person. Ghost accounts should be weeded out. People who didn't exist in the village cannot be receiving monies. And therefore, with the efficiency that which is enabled by technology, we have saved that kind of money. And saving means that you have more money to spend on projects which are waiting or welfare schemes which need to be elaborated on. So technology was adopted in every sphere of uh, activity for the government to improve its governance. Uh, the foundation was laid on that. And also such legislations which made the country all come together, give solutions for our businesses, IBC, GST, were all uh, steps taken in the first term itself. The second term, you had reforms continuing. A clear stated privatization policy was announced in the budget. And because of the privatization policy, we were able to say, government is not going to be uh, in chosen areas at the cost of private sector. The policy was very simple and straightforward. It said, everywhere, every sector is opened up for private. And private sector, therefore, were welcome, even into areas in which they were not allowed to enter earlier, such as space, such, such as defense production. And you can see within five years what difference that has made in terms of the export of defense producers from India, in terms of the number of startups who are in space sector today, as a result of which today India has become one of those elite club of um, geospatial activities, which you wouldn't have had a couple of years ago with private participation. Yes, India did have a lead uh, because of the government alone policy in space. But today with the inputs coming from the uh, private sector, it's becoming lots more versatile. That's the point I would like to underline there. So the private sector uh, or the government's policy was uh, very well laid out. That opened up avenues for more foreign direct investments to come into the country. The caps were removed for foreign direct investments in areas which for a very long time had remained at 26% or 49% and so on. With that, you find India receives a lot of foreign money today as joint venture partnership or direct investments themselves. So when they come for investment, they are not going to go away that easily. Or even if they want to sh sell off their um, part of the equity, there will always be somebody else who is going to take their place. It's very different from the FIIs of the world or the FPIs of the world. So if the second term gave birth to such very uh, well-considered opening up, banking sector's health was also improved. You find them now providing uh, rich dividends to the government. Their NPA levels are coming down. They are only going to further come down in the next few months. With banking sector revving to perform, and banking sector, particularly the scheduled commercial banks, going back to doing their core business of lending and receiving deposits, and not getting into long-term high-risk investments for which the government has come up with a bank which is for infrastructure funding and for development. The NAPFID was the bank which India waited for a very long time and because they have come into play, the banks can get back to making sure short and medium credits are the ones they are focusing on rather than looking at high long term invest, uh, credit lending and since there was a credit asset mismatch you had the high risk of bank performance going down. That's now avoided because there's an institution taking care of it. So not just one reform, 
but a chain of reforms, each supporting the other, and as a result, the economy's foundations have got strengthened. As we do this, we've also identified those new sunrise sectors, which are the ones on which we are putting money. You heard for uh, research and development, the Anusandan Kosh that we've started with one lakh crore, uh, which can be now put into a particular SPV, which will raise more resources, and even fund risk-ridden, um, let's say, innovative work which is being done by private sector as well. It is not just for government work, R&D money for that. You also have Green Hydrogen Mission, which has again got uh, about uh, 20,000 crores, which will be promoting green hydrogen. There are missions within the government and various departments which are promoting electric vehicles. Artificial intelligence is something which I mentioned in my budget, which is going to be sure uh, a big uh, leap forward for India. We will be setting up three major centers of excellence for artificial intelligence, and that will give us a good advantage in being world leaders in terms of our young being qualified in artificial intelligence and being ready to lead the world on various instruments and uh, use cases that they can build out of artificial intelligence. If these are the ways in which we are building, there are genomics, uh, geospatial areas, uh, rare earths, renewable energy, all of which are getting high priority from the government. Now, if this is the way we are indicating from the point of view of policy making that these sectors will attain um, good traction and policy and fiscal support will be offered for them, you also find investments coming in those areas already. But if this is the way India has to strengthen itself equally in the social areas for building up uh, empowerment programs for people who are on the bottom of the uh, ladder, several skilling programs are happening. Uh, I do not want to remind that uh, in, in terms of efficient distribution of food grains through the PDS, again technology is used so that people can draw their ration wherever they are and the families which stay back in the villages can have their ration. That portion which is unutilized by the working member of the house can be taken in the village itself. So these are small steps to make sure that families don't suffer because of mobility-related issues. The way in which infrastructure spending has gone up in this country, uh, where it was only 1.8 lakh crores in 2013-14, that's gone up to 11 lakh crores. Now, in the latest budget, which is a vote on account, I've increased that further and also already indicated before the July budget that the emphasis on capital expenditure will still continue. So the public expenditure itself making sure that investment in building assets is high priority through the government, and it is not just through the central government. We are also giving 50-year interest-free loans to the state governments for building capital assets. So India's picture if you want to look at it that way, at a macro level, macroeconomic stability is in place. Inflation management, far, far better than the last 10 years before 2014, where it went to double digit, we have not. There has been co close, uh, let's say, we are playing in tandem with the RBI in making sure inflation is well within the tolerance band. Particularly food inflation is being uh, contained uh, it's, I think, in the range of 3.4 or something of that kind. Seasonal shortages in food does spike up the inflation, but that's under control because there is a group of ministers who are looking at it. And uh, if uh, this is the way in which uh, inflation management is happening, macroeconomic stability being what it is, you had three quarters of growth above 8%. And hopefully the fourth quarter, which ends tomorrow, will also have it in the range of eight or eight, above eight, resulting in 23, 24, having an average 
growth in the GDP of 8 or over 8 percent is what my expectation is. But uh, I leave it b before you. I'm sure all of you are monitoring the Indian economy as much as we do. But the three quarters consistent growth over 8 percent is real good news. And I thank the people of India for being so energetic and coming out to make sure that India remains the fastest growing economy. One last word on how Honorable Prime Minister looks at Indian society, uh, identifies sectors or identifies sections of people who need assistance from us. Uh, he very clearly put it in four different uh, letters which stand as an acronym, the Garib, the youth, the farmers, and the women. Because if you touch any one of these segment, segments, caste, creed, region, rural, urban, everything gets covered. So if you were to help women, if you were to empower women, if you were to skill women, if you, if you were to increase the real income of women, it cuts across all these considerations, rural, urban, caste, uh, region, religion, everything. So women, similarly youth, cuts across all these divisive lines. So the approach that Prime Minister is taking is to make sure those who need to be assisted will be assisted and no play of religion or caste comes into it. No play of urban or rural comes into it. No play of northeast versus south. The divisive politics that we hear today, although the only agenda and I'm talking openly a bit of politics before you. These are times to talk about it. Whilst this is the canvas with which Honorable Prime Minister wants to give us that castle that we have to reach in 2047, and all of us will have a role to play. And these are the very uh, various sectors through which we want to build the strength of India, provide the youth the kind of support for their dreams and aspirations. The other side, Shockingly, despite the benefit technology has given us, shockingly has one agenda which is a negative agenda, remove Modi, is that one negative agenda. And the kind of divisive language with which India is now being treated again, which is what was done over 70 years, is this divide, not south divide, is this vituperative language used for a religion, but very uh, kind uh, language for some other religion. This division doesn't hold good in the face of things which Prime Minister Modi does. Ujjwala reaches everybody. Toilets reaches everybody, not just the minority or the majority. So the, 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 the uh, alternative is the negative alternative of remove Modi and the language through which we will remove Modi for them is the North-South debate, the caste debate back again and also talking about only some privileges to be given to some sections because that's what is my vote bank. India's fed up of these sort of things. We don't want any of this. And in the last 10 years, we've proven that despite all the false allegations that they would put on the Prime Minister, there has not been one instance of discrimination in any of these criteria: caste favoring, religion favoring, region favoring, none of that. People themselves concede that every benefit, every um, social welfare program has reached everybody. Every opportunity has reached everybody. There's more to do, I admit. And therefore, this is uh, the Vikasit Bharat and the Yatra through which we want to reach there. The Yatra is not for us. The Yatra is for all Indians so that we reach there and we owe it to the next generation that they have a better India in which we contribute and they build, and that is what all of us are going to see by 2047. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am.
uh, for uh, taking time out to address the audience and for also taking uh, questions. Uh, one of the threads I'll take up from the threads, uh, you know, from your speech. Uh, one of the things you said was on, uh, uh, you know, uh, the next set of uh, reforms will be in uh, Panchayat Raj and uh, urban, uh, uh, you know, governance bodies. Uh, so can you, can you elaborate a little bit on that, please? Well, uh, I think in the last uh, 20, 30 years, or even since 1991, whether it is urged by the, uh, by the IMF, or whether con the country itself has been working towards wanting to reform India's economy, bring in reforms in various aspects of the economy, it's always been addressed to the center. Now, during the COVID and also a little afterwards, We've been working with the states to say, if there are things that we can extend to the states, we would extend, but certainly, would you mind taking up some reform in the power sector? Would you mind taking up some reform in the one nation, one ration card? And so on. And many states have uh, enthusiastically come forward, and not only come forward, now they are in a position to say, that has helped them. So if that is the way in which we could go to the states, it's also now the time for taking it down further because eventually when businesses have to start or investments have to come, they have to be grounded somewhere. And that is at the level of some village, at the level of some periphery in a city. And in those places, if elected bodies are not uh, aware or are not ready for being open, transparent, welcoming. Everything that we do will be in the paper and not on the ground. So one set of, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't use the word demands, I would say suggestions, which uh, people have as far as the next generation of reforms is concerned are direct tax reforms. Because we see that there are a lot of cases and there is a lot of money which is there, uh, backlog which is there. Uh, in terms of uh, amount long dead income tax cases? Um, well, I take your point on reforms, direct taxation reforms. But on the question of amounts being pending, cases uh, lingering in the co courts, um, by introducing the faceless system, we have very clearly indicated that we are looking at, and in fact, there was a tax uh, payers charter which was introduced during one of the budgets, 21, if I remember correct. So uh, I'm not closing anything to do with the reforms, but the question of, you know, monies being held there or in the courts, the question has been partly addressed by the fact that we said cases cannot be opened beyond six years. And every time through the year, when notices are sent, so that that assessment year doesn't get time barred by which time the IT uh, sends the CBDT, sends the notice to the per person asking for explanation. If the explanation is fine, it is anyway dealt with by an, a faceless officer. And if it is fine, the matter ends there or else somebody else comes into picture. Again, faceless, appeal happens. So an uh, assessee doesn't have to keep records for 10 years uh, only six years and beyond that it doesn't get open unless the amount there is substantial or some, some search or some, some seizure somewhere has given some reason to think that this particular account has to be opened because there has been something else which has come out, which requires the principal commissioner's specific clearance and permission. So that change was already brought in. In fact, I may take this opportunity to say that many uh, notices which are being sent now is because they have to start honoring that six-year time limitation and the year which the last assessment uh, which comes into the six-year limitation beyond which they can't open up, this 31st March is when the time bar is imposed on the tax authorities themselves, meaning they can't open it up first April day after tomorrow morning on that year, which is six years now. So they are rushing a lot of these, uh, you know, notices 
just to say, hey, I've asked you a question, reply, we'll take it up further. So it's not as if it's a new method of harassment. It is because the compliance for the board itself is now getting time barred and they have to access people for whom information is not readily available. It, there is also another dimension. I'm sorry I'm taking a bit of a time on this. Uh, there's also another uh, dimension here. If, for instance, you've been in the manual process of keeping your accounts with the CBDT, and the CBDT maintained a manual account of yours, till a certain year it was so, the conversion started happening. But in some areas and in some years, if the uh, details are still in manual form, they are now being digitized, and therefore a question comes to you once again to say, look, we don't seem to have this patch of information about you, would you fill in? And if you fill in, that's the end of the story. But that is not a notice which has come to you because there's a suspicion. It's more the gap in data because of the transfer from the manual to the digital. So these are reasons why before 31st March, you have a flurry of notices going. So the changes are happening in direct taxation, but I take your point on reforms. Uh, you touched upon the North-South divide. One area where we can see that is in fiscal federalism because it is increasingly becoming a contested area, especially when it comes to the southern states. One can argue part of it is politics, but then there are also some asymmetries in uh, demographics and uh, economic development. And some experts are suggesting that fiscal federalism has weakened after the planning commission went away and uh, now it rests on only one pillar, the finance commission. I mean, how do you think, what are your views and do you think there are fault lines here that need to be resolved? So I would want journalists to put the facts out. Planning Commission strengthened fiscal federalism? Sorry, it was not even a statutory body. It was a body just like that, dispensing huge sums of money, meaning saying this state should get this kind of a project, that, and states came begging to the Planning Commission. Prime Minister Modi hated that. He said, why should we, we are elected governments, why should we go begging to the Planning Commission? Because it's not even an authority. And therefore, when the true purpose of that kind of a planning body was brought back in the Niti Ayo, you are a think tank for the government. Give us the advantage of which project to do regionally or which projects to be taken up because of a concept or which is the way in which we at attract newer businesses, which are the states which have new leverages which they can use up and which are the states which have to be reached out to because they have uh, inherent challenges and so on. So the idea of a planning body was restored, I would think, in the Niti Aayog and the idea of elected state governments coming to the center, not to the central government, but to a body which was not even a statutory body, saying, please, a lot of this. That was outrage. We lived with outrage for a very long time, and I think it is right that has been changed. I don't think it adversely affects the fiscal federalism of the country. But yet, yes, the point that you say, that because of performance, and this is one example only of population. The weightage given for population-related matters in the Finance Commission's basket probably is more, proportionately more than others which deserve that kind of a attention. So the states will have to negotiate with the Finance Commission, speaking about the earlier system and seeking something else better now equally as much as the labor which comes from states such as Bihar, Jharkhand, Orissa, wouldn't come if they were also as efficient as the other states were in terms of population. So I'm not weighing in on one or the other much more than I should. But yes, I also come from the south. I understand in certain areas efficiencies have come in on a larger scale. That which efficiency probably doesn't exist in some parts of North.
but that doesn't mean that we can speak in these terms of north and south each state has its own strengths each state has its own contribution to the gdp of this country we need to pep all of them up but the language used is very separatist and i object to that it's a big business now that the states will have to negotiate better with the finance commission to make them formulate something which will be fair and just um, because of this uh, deteriorating i would say center state relations uh, maybe not with all states do you think it kinds of takes away from the efficiency of the uh, capital expenditure projects in terms of implementation as in we get less bang for the buck if states and center work together uh, i mean because they are responsible for the last mile connectivity or the, the last mile implementation uh, wouldn't it be better i mean how do you ensure that deteriorating center state i'm sorry not at all it's completely politicizing center states and some states do it unabatedly and they also approach the courts and the courts thank god in this country speak the truth and i take each such opportunity to go to the court with a document to tell them where what has been done where has the discrimination been if at all i explain it in the court court see it so deteriorating is not a language i want a fair minded journalist to use politicizing center state yes you may want to say it i'll also join you on it so sticking you know in terms of uh, capex see the government has been really pushing the pedal on uh, capital expenditure and you said that the emphasis will continue but at the same time uh, you know you have also been signaling to the private sector to be more proactive in making fresh investments rather than waiting for a further improvement in demand conditions what is the trend that you see here what is the uh, private sector investments no no what is the dash that i see here the trend the trend, trend. i think we are losing out in terms of seeing where it is happening by seeing where it is not happening private sector is going in in a big way in the new renewable energy sector private sector is also also taking high risks also looking at hydrogen the green hydrogen ammonia semiconductors imagine three semiconductor investment over 1 lakh crore to start with private sector that's not government investment so actually all of us will have to now be ready to look at sectors where private sector in india has already come forward invested shown that appetite to take high risks and not keep looking at only integrated steel plants are they coming to glow do you know more on more on aluminum yes that is also happening coal gasification is also happening through private sector so i think india's in private sector is investing in areas which are giving a newer investment opportunity risk ridden but they are coming forward we should start looking there and counting those which are the sectors you should think that i should say semiconductor green hydrogen solar uh, renewables and also looking at materials rare earths geonemics they are there ai and also um, in uh, medical uh, diagnostic equipments uh bringing back api into this country which we lost out on apis are now the and also the key pharmaceutical uh produces these are now new areas in which india's private sector is going in a big way and investing that which was almost taken away to china from india who were leaders in api today are back these are only private sector activities so that is investment but private consumption growth has also no, you know not really oh you didn't ask me on private investments you did so on consumption consumption has growth has uh, also not really uh, you know it has been kind of suppressed in the last few quarters 
Uh, I mean, what is your view on that? In I terms don't of want people to look at it month on month and keep asking the same questions. You think 8% growth would have been possible in three consecutive quarters if there was no consumption happening? I'm afraid we are becoming easily lazy in looking at data. We want to look at month on month for something which is already printed in red, but we are not willing to see the overall year picture. Otherwise, India couldn't be growing at the rate at which it is growing, whilst the world, rest of them are putting all energies and they are just not able to rise. The global situation is very volatile, very uncertain, very, very complex. The VUCA factor, volatile, uncertain, complex, and absolutely unpredictable. So we need to understand that if that's a situation outside, how are we lasting the way we are lasting? Even among emerging economies, we're actually doing much better. Countries, emerging economies, which have quite a few strength because of the product, the commodities that they have, the wealth that they have in terms of the commodities with which they can bargain. We are not even in that league in terms of the commodity richness. We still import a lot of our main requirements, but still we are the fastest growing. If you don't mind, I will say this. We should get out of this self-deprecating, depreciating attitude and stand up and say, yes, it's possible for India. You don't need to hype the situation. But running ourselves down, enough we have to get out of this believe in ourselves we can deliver believe in ourselves we are uh, entrepreneurs are doing brilliant work so we need to have that backbone to say yes we will do it we are doing it we can take it further so that question was asked more in terms of trying to understand what will be the drivers of growth, you know, in the future. I mean, this year, as you said, we are looking at 8%, the just ending financial year. But if you have to look at the forthcoming financial year, I mean, what do you think will be the next big driver? I mean, let's not just look only at the next financial year, but over the, ne let's say the next thing. five years. I've, <clears throat> I've fairly elaborated on mm. those issues. If you're going to empower the women of this country, the youth of this country, and the farmers are given the strength, you're going to have agriculture, the rural areas, all developing. And let us not forget the numbers here. By 2030, you're going to have 70 crore Indians in the middle class, meaning middle income group with purchasing power in their hand. And that 70 crores of 2030 will touch 100 crores by 2047. Middle income group with that kind of number will have to consume. They will have the purchasing power for you to produce things which they can buy. And if you're strengthening the rural areas, strengthening the youth, strengthening women, giving them skills, the drone didi is a massive success because women are volunteering to get themselves trained. And that is going to have a very big mindset impact in the rural India with women holding drones and controlling them, spraying fertilizers, assessing the density of the crop on the ground. These are all not small things. What you couldn't achieve during the social era, socialistic era, in terms of empowering people, well, good try, no harm, is now getting done by the adoption of technology among women, by use of mobile phone among women, a small vendor of uh, vegetables locally grown in a farm attains a lot more satisfaction looking at not just the income, but the way in which it's getting accounted for through her phone instantly. The mindset change when women use phones, when women use drones, and also that they are earning money, are all big ticket reforms in the ground, in the villages, and these are going to have a lot of ripple effect, I would think. Uh, switching topics slightly, um, I'm the Indian capital market has done well in recent times, uh, but uh, SEBI has cautioned about froth in certain 
parts of the market. Uh, similarly, the RBI governor has also cautioned about, uh, has raised certain concerns about unsecured lending. Uh, I mean, what is your view? Are you concerned about overheating our asset bubbles? Well, I think uh, the regulators speak on those matters. I, for one, would not say any further than saying that the Indian markets, even during great volatility outside, have held their own. Where there's need for a course correction, they've done it on their own. And also making sure that the way in which they handle it has also been very uniquely to India. The regulators will have to do their job. I'm not undermining that. But I think Indian markets have been lots more saner. Problems of overvaluation, is it short duration, is it froth, is it bubble? All that debate can go on. And silently, I'm sure the regulators will handle it. So uh, the government has done well to bring back financial stability, you know, especially after the days of the twin uh, balance sheet crisis. However, uh, in public sector banks, do you think certain reform agenda are unfinished? I mean, what are your thoughts? No, private sector banks are now being nudged to be a lot more professional in handling their affairs. There are small asks from the institutions themselves because they would like to recruit people from the market at that kind of a rate, whether that is going to happen, because ultimately we want high quality professionals running the banks. The banks have now come to stand on their own. They are able to go to the market, raise monies for their developmental activities. They are no longer looking at government to uh, infuse capital every year. Uh, so those will continue. And globally, uh, uh, you know, global bond markets are pretty excited about India. However, uh, you know, you have uh, been very cautious to do anything, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to facilitate inclusion uh, of Indian bonds and in global indices. Can you explain the thinking behind that? As in, we haven't like really gone out of the way to ensure that this happens. Um, there are two things which I'll just give as a broad observation. India uh, may not necessarily be the bond kind of a question, but the fact that our external borrowings have always been well within the limit, and we still address issues of concern within the country, is a fact that we'll have to bear in our minds. Two, the participation in our bond market is a lot more buoyant nowadays, even within India. All right, we've opened up to an extent. We'll watch that space. We're not close-minded about anything. Right, ma'am, can we take some questions from the audience? Yes, questions. Yes. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Right here. So, uh, ma'am, uh, as an education entrepreneur who's setting up schools uh, in tier two, tier three cities, well, one of the main constraints in the industry is access to private capital, which is uh, capped because of the trust and society structure. Now, when we speak about Viksit Bharat, the whole dream of demographic dividend will be realized if we provide enough skills to the, to the young, for which we need quality schools to really exponentially grow. For that, uh, private capital would be needed, especially to solve the real estate problem, which is the first problem when you set up incremental schools. So is the government thinking of allowing private limited companies to set up schools and or allowing FDI into the school space to answer this problem? Well, I think the new education policy somewhat addresses this issue, but not the core issue of uh, trust and society format with which education institutions have to be run. And it is that specific issue that you are raising. Um, I can see a lot of difference playing out in the way in which education is expanding in India and the new education policy to a large extent has infused quite a lot of oxygen into the system. But on the core issue of whether we are going to be able to get out of that requirement of a society or a trust as a prerequisite for education institutions, I'll have to wait and uh, see how the HRD is going to handle it. So let's see. 
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for your inspiring words. Uh, I must say, all the work which you're doing, uh, you're all beneficiaries of it sitting in India. The one question I had for you, you spoke about VUCA world, right? I mean, people, and, and geopolitics has never been more uncertain and, and volatile as it is today. Now, we are fairly insulated, but there's one thread where we do connect with the world, which is oil. Now, should the geopolitics worsen and oil prices go towards 125, 120, 130 barrels a day, how does it kind of, how does government think about it? Give us some framework on its dependence, its play on currency and what's the government's internal thinking to be a bit more insulated on the oil front? I think first answer for that is India's own production from the offshore wells is now going up. There are monthly fluctuations, but I think the emphasis given that we should also produce oil for our own uh, is a point that I would like to place on, uh, on the table. The other is... I think there's been this attempt to understand the government's numbers by asking, will you be concerned if it crosses $100? Will you be concerned or you made provision in the budget if it is 110 These are more like telling me that, will you stop buying oil if it is 120 Can I stop it? No. It's a question of how do I fund it. It's also a question of how do I not transfer the burden to the common people of India. It's a burden, it's a question of how much of strategic reserve do I have so that if there is that kind of a spike, how long will it last till that time will I be able to use my strategic reserve and so on. So they, there is no one single answer to it. As long as all of us are conscious of it and the governance policy making is ceased of that uncertainty, I think we'll be able to face it. Hello, ma'am. I'm Bhavish, uh, Equitas Capital. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for all the efforts being taken by the government to take uh, where it is and your cl uh, clarity on the vision that you have. We touched upon uh, direct taxes reforms, but uh, just to kind of, you know, the developed nations have much lower tax rates than India has. And as we progress towards Vikis, Vikset Bharat, uh, how do you see this uh, trend coming along? I mean, there's a Laffer's curve also, which results in lower taxes, resulting in higher revenues for the government. What are the key indicators that you see that will, in the economic indicators, that will result in taxes coming on? We all love paying taxes, especially for the efforts the government is doing for infrastructure building, etc. But how do you see this panning out? It's not a pleasant answer to give. <laughs> Where exactly are taxes far lower than India? I'm talking of the direct taxes. US is an example people quote me very often. Every state in the USA has its own tax, the federal tax. I sat once over a week to see how the 50 states of United States taxes. In some cases, it is beyond 80%, both put together. I'm not saying I'm imitating or copying one country or the other. In general, this idea of India's taxes are very high. And I don't want to say I won't consider any further reduction at all. God knows. Meaning July budget will have to take on board all these voices that you hear. And whoever the finance minister will present it in July will have to keep that in mind. But the fact remains that this is a country which saw 97% tax pre-91. And annual increases were crazy. After 2014, irrespective of the desperation in the situation in spite of COVID and other things, Prime Minister Modi's one and only line was, you shall not increase. All right, in excise duty on crude, petrol, there has been fluctuations going up, coming down. But also with the consideration on the code, direct taxation, reforms, and everything else, a second parallel alternative for tax has been given, where the rates have come down, where it is simple, no exemptions, nothing. And the grievance was you have not given us even standard deduction. We brought that in as well. So please go into the second alternative. 
It's even simpler, it's even lower. But if it has got to be only 7 crore people paying tax, but 140 crores aspirations of good roads, good airports, look at Bangalore, look at uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Airport, why can't we have like, it's just not going to be able to function. I understand the Laffer curve argument, and that's what is playing out now. Efficiency in collection, increased buoyancy is all because of the Laffer curve principle. So I do take your point on even lesser burden, We'll work it out. Last couple of questions. Ma'am, uh, my name is Neil Borate and I'm the personal finance editor at Mint. So I wanted to uh, get your view on a issue of, uh, con for consumers to do with insurance mis-selling. So currently, uh, the commissions on insurance are far higher than what people get in other financial products. and. Uh, you know, any person who walks into a bank, the first thing they are sold is an insurance policy because of this disparity. So, uh, I know it's a regulatory issue, it should be uh, taken up by the IRDAI, but they really haven't looked at this, they haven't done much about this. So, can the finance ministry also look into this? You know, on behalf of uh, all the readers, I must say, that particular section of Mint is doing brilliantly well. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Lots of people who read Mint straight go into that page look at, you know, those individuals you quote, so-and-so has planned, his background is this, so-and-so is this one, but he has gone in for a different kind of planning for his... Oh, people see themselves in it, and it's a well-read page, I would think. You're doing very well on that. Um, see, on insurance, there are quite a few things which are matters worthy of discussion. The regulator is very active. Nowadays, I, I can closely monitor it. Um, I also look at how bank assurances are working. There are bank employees who also say we are made to do insurance. We can't see why. And this option of several insurance being before me, I can choose from them, gets narrowed down if bank themselves promote their own insurance. So on insurance itself, not just this, health insurance premiums, uh, senior citizens paying quite a lot, and the question that you have raised are all absolutely worthy of discussion, taking forward, and trying to reform. And I will assure you that a lot of discussion on these things are happening. Maybe the next round when decisions can be taken, it will be taken. I have one last question. Yes, gentleman at the back. Please get him a mic. Ma'am, thank you for your address. Uh, you had talked about Vixit Bharat. We are all talking about uh, 2047. Now, the key question is you mentioned some states, the eastern states, eastern UP, Bihar, Jharkhand. West Bengal and to an, a certain extent Odisha and maybe the Northeast. We need a good raise in the income levels there. Has the government got any thoughts on what to do in these states apart from paying all those uh, direct benefit transfers, roads and all those other things? Thank you. I think the government has already started doing the fact that in spite of having announced uh, uh, public sector enterprises policy, the restoration uh, of uh, the refineries and also the fertilizer companies in that area, Baroni, uh, Gorakhpur, and bringing gas pipeline connection for all of them so that their production is going to be efficient and that it serves India's own fertilizer requirement are very clearly indicating that eastern region will have to have a mixed bag of approach. Uh, an approach which is not going to be straight one line, but various routes will have to be adopted. Public sector investments, investment in capital uh, uh, asset creation, also looking at how farm in those areas can benefit by modernization, ensuring that newer industries go there. So 
the one line which Honorable Prime Minister used, and I think it indicates everything, that he plans for the, I'm not talking of Northeast, plans for the Eastern region, Orissa, Jharkhand, Bihar, um, and uh, Bengal, Bengal uh, is that they have to become the engine of our growth. You just need that power to pull the entire economy which means we are just not trying to talk about uplifting them, but we want them to be so empowered that they can be the triggers of further and further growth, which means our approach is not going to be one line. Our approach is not just going to be waiting for private investments. Our approach is not going to be just setting up one mother industry and running away. It's going to be through all other ways in which that region can get what it deserves. Thank you, ma'am, for taking time out today and being here with us and answering all questions patiently. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Nirmala Sitaraman, the Honorable Minister of Finance and Corporate. Thank you very much, ma'am. Ma'am, please accept this token of our deep gratitude and appreciation on behalf of Mint and every person in this room. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a thunderous round of applause for Honorable Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs, Srimati Nirmala Sitaraman. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Say good to your seats. I have a